I remember at that point feeling like this electric shock of anger like down my spine because I knew the reason that I'd failed it wasn't because I was stupid or whatever. It was because I hadn't applied myself and I hadn't made effort. But what I can also remember at that point is thinking to myself, I'm never going to feel like this again. I'm never, ever going to not achieve something because I haven't tried. Welcome to this bonus episode of the Right Route podcast. Where I'll be talking to Cube Learning CEO Joe Crossley. We'll be exploring his experiences of the world of work, how he got to where he is today, and his advice, tips and tricks on how you can progress no matter where you are in your career journey. If this is the first time you're listening to the show, then welcome. Consider subscribing and listening back to any of the previous episodes from Series 1 where we feature Cody Damale, the star of the BBC's The Apprentice. We discuss all aspects of career development and hear from special guests from a wide range of different industries who are at different stages of their career. So without any further delay, let's get started with the interview. So hi to Joe and welcome to The Right Route. For those people who are listening... Could I just get you to introduce yourself and what it is that you actually do? Yep. Uh, my name's Joe Crossley. I'm Chief Executive of Cube Learning. So we're a national training provider that deliver pre-employment courses, traineeship programs and apprenticeships. Awesome. Now, one thing I like to ask people mm. is, is that what you imagined yourself doing when you was at school? Because, I'm, I mean, for me, you know, football are the classic things. Yeah. Um, fighter pilot yeah but i wonder if that's the same for you um i never wanted to be a fi- fighter pilot but i wanted to be a footballer uh, i'm still hoping that i might get the call my <laughs> knees are a bit dodgy now but um but no i didn't uh imagine myself doing anything like this um i think veterinary i, I wanted to be a vet when i was at school when i was young and then i wanted to uh, be an occupational therapist bizarrely um because i did some work experience when i was about 15 and enjoyed that um, but fundamentally, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a classic case of floating between different things. You know, see someone on the telly, that looks good. Really, I wanted to do a job where I get to drive a nice car. So that was my biggest ambition when I was at school, really. So, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So, obviously, you have come a little way away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like you say, for many people, I think it's, uh, me included, I didn't really... I knew what I was interested in, but I didn't really know what it was that I actually wanted to do. And I didn't at the time, even though my the job that I'm now doing in love mm. even existed. Mm. Um, and I'm sure that when, when you're growing up and you're kind of that young, tender age where you're making your choices, mm. you don't necessarily even realise what a CEO does. You might have heard the title. Mm-hmm. Um, so take us through a little bit of your journey of how you got to where you are today. Um, I think when... What I would say is that whatever I did when I was younger, I always wanted to be the best at, if that makes sense. So Mm -hmm. I did a lot of sport and I sort of wanted to always achieve the best I could. So I always had that sort of like determination to do well. It just wasn't always necessary the things I was supposed to do well at. So, you know, I was excellent at sensible soccer. That came out in about 1995. I worked really hard at that. And I think um, when I I left school, I didn't do very well in my GCSEs. I started work in retail and um, I enjoyed the people aspect of that. I liked um, serving customers. I liked solving problems um, and I liked being part of a team, which you are in retail. Uh, Also, I learned a lot about how to communicate properly, how to do different things. Um, So that's how I started. And then a role came up around sort of organizing the store training so looking after people's training records um organizing product training and stuff like that so i started to do that and i that's where i got my first taste of of training really and it was very light touch because it was a lot of this is how something works or you have to do this because if you don't you can't use that sort of thing um but i enjoyed seeing the penny drop with people and then I became a management trainee um, and part of that was moving all around the country. So when I was 19, I left home um, and I had, I was quite lucky. I had a nice house or my parents had a nice house in Norfolk and I ended up moving to a council flat in Sheffield. And I can remember standing outside the evening I got there looking out over all these burnt out cars and stuff like that. Sheffield is lovely. I have to, I have to add, <laughs> I really enjoyed my time there, but I moved all over the country and doing that, that at a young age gave me, 
a different type of confidence. You know, I became a little bit more sociable, much more outgoing, obviously learned how to um, manage the household and stuff like that, that a lot of 19 year olds wouldn't necessarily have to learn. Um, but what I found during that period of my time is that I enjoyed the practical learning. So if I was learning about how to deal with um, a difficult customer, you learn how to negotiate with people, you know, so you do learn a lot of skills. And that's what I did in that period of time. But then as I sort of progressed into retail management, I found what I enjoyed was actually during that period of recruitment, when you take somebody on to work on the shop floor, and they might have been in a similar position to myself, you know, struggled at school, um, left uh, in a similar sort of way to me. And then you kind of take those people under your wing. And to be fair, there are some people where you can't help them because it's not quite the right time. But the ones that you can, you spend time with them, talk to them about what they're worried about, try and find jobs for them to do that will give them more experience, more confidence. And then you sort of see them grow as well. And that's what I started to really enjoy about my retail career. So so that's how I got interested in sort of people and people development. It wasn't really about this is a qualification that you should do. It was about learn these skills, solve that problem. But through that, it you can see, it certainly gave me confidence in my career, but I also enjoyed seeing other people gain confidence and and, you know, want to know more about how something works so that was really how I got into the people development side of it and then when I'd been working in retail probably for about 12 years the company that I was with it was obvious it was struggling a little bit so um, I didn't want to hang around to see (laughs) the the aftermath of that so I started thinking about what what should I do next it was probably the right time for me to think about moving on and because I'd always enjoyed the training and development bit I went to work for a training company um, delivering work-based learning in management retail warehousing uh, customer service and that I really did enjoy Um, you learn really the basic skills can be applied to any company um there's a certain core set of skills that you have to get right um it was good and interesting to see how different technology was applied in different organizations doing the same thing that's really interesting um and then after about two years of doing the training i started to get involved in the contract negotiation um the profiling of contracts compliance auditing the stuff that I now consider to be quite boring (laughs) that I have somebody else to do for me because, uh, um, yeah, because it's, it's nicer that way. Um, so as a result of that, I then got involved in the business development side. So there was a lot of sales and marketing, which again, it's a, it's a different skill. I had picked up some parts of in retail, but actually going out, engaging with customers, engaging with businesses, engaging with different stakeholders. I worked on the probation board at Norwich prison for a little while, And then because of that, I became really involved in helping people that were unemployed find work. So that became like a different chapter in my career because we then built a range of pre-employment courses that help people gain practical skills that were going to get them employed. And then in 2014, I came to work at Cube. Um, It was a much bigger provider than the one I've been at before. And... Yeah, it's difficult to know where to start from there. So, I, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll hand back to you, Liam. Yeah, not a problem. I, I mean, that's a fascinating insight to to where where you started out, where you first initially gained that passion, and um, and you know, people might not be inspired by that retail retail kind of job that you had at the time, but actually, you found that thing that that lit you up, and and seeing how you could develop people and how you could you could take them from that 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 position of not really going anywhere to give him that responsibility mm. and and yeah fascinating to hear that that you 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 know you made the switch when when you could foresee things not going terribly well but equally that you took that as an opportunity to continue doing what it was that you're passionate about yeah. and then equally um using those core skills that you'd built up and and still, even when you mentioned the boring stuff, um, but it sounds like you still had an eye for that when you were in that role because you went to the prison and did a great job there and and you drove kind of new ways of being able to help people that perhaps were a bit forgotten, dare I say it. 
Um, so so fan- fascinating to hear that. And I think I think as well the the underlying sort of um, I don't know. Um, I'm not going to say the the thing that I've got, <laughs> but <laughs> quality. You know, oh. Quality that I've got is a. Uh, I mean, when I was at school and I played a lot of sport. I always wanted to win and I'd get really upset if we didn't, but it's quite inwardly upset. I wasn't like somebody that would throw my toys out the pram. And when I worked in retail, I always wanted our store to be the best, look the best, you know, have the best sales results. I can remember um, when I worked in a store in Essex, we became the first shop um, that generated sales of a quarter of a million pounds in a week. You know, and I can remember the day we did over 50,000 in one day, I kept going to the uh, computer that tracked the sales and just checking it and checking it. And every time you'd see it go up by a little bit, I'd go out and say to people, right, okay, we need to do another X amount. And, you know, part of my retail career, I spent going around stores that were struggling. And I found there was quite a simple formula to actually getting it from not being successful to being successful. There's three really easy things. One was making sure the warehouse was sorted out so you knew what stock to sell and nothing got damaged. The other was um, making sure that the manager's office was organized so everybody knew what the promotions were, that you were adequately staffed. And then there was the element of making sure the staff room looks nice, clean, tidy, and was well painted so people felt valued. And then I found if people uh, felt valued and they felt um, like they were appreciated in the job, you could get more out of them, you know. And I think that was something that I learned through retail. But I think it was that desire to always do better. So even when we got to that point where we turned a store around and it was going to be safe, it's then, well, how do we then push it up the rankings and get it closer to number one? And it was getting people involved, helping people understand that actually, if we need to sell more stuff, let's have a game. Let's pick a £10 note out of this petty cash and whoever gets the biggest sale gets to keep the £10 note at the end of the day. And then you find people become interested in it because they'd say, oh, I've sold this and it's £300. I get the £10 note. And then somebody else says, oh, yes, but I've sold that. And then people start to become really passionate about what they do. And there are different ways to do that. And so I think whatever I did, I always, maybe if I didn't shout about it, I wanted to be the best at it. And I think when I came to work in this sector, it was the same. You know, I, I wanted people to come into the business, scratch away at the surface and see quality. Um, so I think that probably helped. So it's all very well and good sort of thinking, I like, that. I enjoy that, I enjoy that. But I think it's also having that sort of desire to always improve on what you do. Mm. So, and I was, I was like that at school, but I just probably didn't apply it to the right things. I applied it to girls and to sport and to, you know, anything that happened in between a lesson. Um, so yeah, and then it took me a little bit of time to mature. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a great point you make and I think that that kind of desire to always do the best uh, I think is is something that's within quite a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of CEOs and and a lot of successful people that you see out there and and I, I think you know if that's one quality that I think I could inject into a lot of people it would be kind of that self-determination to to get that little improvement to to make something slightly better and you you never know where it's going to go i think what you learn um as you get older i mean i can remember when i was a young retail manager and you'd see something that wasn't right and you'd go to the person who'd done it or not done it and you would start to deal with them in a certain way that didn't always work particularly well but then as you get older you learn how to draw it out in a different way and you learn also how to uh, how different techniques can be applied to different people and i think for me it is trying to surround yourself with people that have that same mindset, you know, that want to do well, want to to be the best they can. And they work in different ways. You know, you look at some of the people on the board at Cube and they have very different approaches, but their underlying objective is to get Cube to be the best it can possibly be. So, um, so yeah, I think that's important. So for people listening and for people who perhaps aspire to to do better, to to kind of work on where they are now and and if it doesn't happen to be a role that they're they're particularly interested in or if it's that they're not in a position at the moment Mm -hmm. have you got any kind of tips and advice on on what people should start doing perhaps starting off in their personal lives to to get onto that ladder to start showing people that they're passionate about what it is that they want to do Mm. um i think think about the things you enjoy think about the things that you're good at um and then think about careers that those things could be applied to 
And I think for me, um, the important thing is that it doesn't matter where you start. It's to be clear about the things that you need to develop to get as far as you can along the pathway, if that makes sense. That's a very broad statement, but I think it's easy to say, I'm not going to do that because it's cleaning, it's cleaning the floor. But actually, um, somebody said to me recently, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, be the best at it. And I think if you become the best warehouse floor sweeper, then hopefully you'll then become the best warehouse stock taker and then the best warehouse manager and et cetera. So I think don't be too proud to start at any point along the way. Um, I don't think there's any, this sounds like, this This makes me feel really old saying this, <laughs> but there is no substitute for hard work. I mean, when I think back over over my career, that is one of the things that I had to I had to inject because I didn't have any formal qualifications and people were coming in uh, on the same rung of the ladder as me. And I might have been in the company for, for two or three years who perhaps had left uh, university and had a degree. So I combated that by working harder um, and just really pushing myself as hard as I could. And I don't think there's any substitute for that. I think I'm quite lucky in that I do have a lot of good ideas. What's strange about me is that I come up with my best ideas when I'm doing stuff that's not at work. Um, so having that sort of streak has always helped me. But I think it is to embrace whatever it is you do, I would say, is my my one nugget of, of advice. Because I think if you enjoy what you do, it will help you to develop what you do. And I think that would be my, my key thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think... Another thing that you you absolutely nailed was work really hard, and and it's such an easy thing to say because we live in a time where people look at Instagram and see the perfect snapshot and they see the end result of how that person has been successful and and often when you you read the stories of Richard Branson, Alan Sugar, all of, all of these kind of inspiring characters or or sports people people point to oh that was when they got their break mm. but actually they forget they've had 10 years mm. of working really hard to yeah, get yeah. to that moment but it, it's strange because i can remember it's, it's funny when we're having this conversation i'm starting to remember things that happened to me 20 years ago and i can remember when i first started working in retail um i wanted to work full time because obviously i needed money um and the manager at the time a guy called rod um it's a fantastic bloke uh said we can't afford to give you a, a full-time contract, but we'll give you 20 hours. So I just used to work full-time anyway. And I did the other 20 hours for free. Well, I'm not advocating that, but eventually they got so sick of me coming in when I wasn't supposed to. They just said, look, we might as well just pay you full-time. So they did in the end. But I think um, it was alongside that. I mean, it was just continually thinking of things to do to improve wherever I was, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think... I was quite relentless and I can be quite relentless now in terms of if I want to achieve something, it is talking to the people around you, making it clear what that end goal has to be, giving them the flexibility to come up with the ideas to get there and then just continually pushing and pushing and pushing. And I think I've always had that within me. Um, and, you know, I think if you if you pick the right job and there's enough elements of that job that you enjoy, and you can make going to work not feel like you're going to work, then actually you're pretty lucky. <laughs> you know, and I, I am quite fortunate that there are some days where I don't feel like I'm at work when I'm at work. Um, there are some days where I really feel like I'm at work when I'm at work. So it does balance out. But I think if you can achieve that, then you're pretty lucky, really. That's fantastic, Joe. Thank you. Let me just take you back to when we we're talking about you in the shop and suddenly you could recognise people that, they had something. There was something about them. Um, I'm sure as your time as a manager um, and potentially as an assessor and moving forward um, that you were able to identify perhaps some similar traits of people that um, that perhaps people could work on as a skill to, to help them actually get into that position. Is there anything that you could give tips or advice on? Um, I mean, I, I, I always found the best starting point was the soft skills, you know, and I think... When people come through um, a non-academic route, where you tend to see the initial flaws is how they present themselves. So quite often that's how they stand. It's how they um, how they are when you're talking to them. You know, they might hunch themselves over, look away, fail to make eye contact. And I think 
it's that bit first that you have to work on. And I think once you've got somebody stood in front of you who's attentive, who's listening, who's enthusiastic about what you're saying to them, then you start to see a change because actually they grow in confidence. And I can remember one guy coming to see me who um, uh, had a terrible CV. And at the start of the CV, it talked about how he was a washer-upper in a pub. And then on page three, it said that he'd done a degree in computer design or something like that. And actually, um, you see the impact of all those knockbacks on someone. And then it's picking out that that nugget to say, actually, oh, you've done that. And then you can see that person change. And I think, for me, it, it's it's getting the confidence right. So helping people to um, to believe a little bit in themselves. And then it's what you then do to help that grow. So it's getting them to learn a particular skill. That's that's always a good one. You'd always find something nice and simple. And then you could go back and say, wow, that's really good. And then you pick out other things that are slightly more tricky. And then you have to be careful because what you don't want to do is get them entrenched in something too quickly that might knock their confidence like a difficult customer complaint or something like that. But you just compound what you're getting them to do day by day, week by week. And then all of a sudden you start to see them want to do more stuff. And that really is like education. I mean, I left school with no qualifications, but I did actually do. Uh, I have done qualifications in my career. I've done a level two apprenticeship. I've done a level three apprenticeship. And I've done a level five apprenticeship as well. So I used those qualifications to enhance what I already knew and apply technique to it. Um, so I think for me, the starting point is about getting people to present themselves in the right way, you know, not just how they stand and, and how they make eye contact, but actually look smart. I can remember saying to one guy who work, who still works for me now, it's not you, Liam, <laughs> um, you know, um, he, he'd he left school, very similar to me, no qualifications, um, had really struggled for a period of time to find a job. I gave him a chance because I'd met him, thought he was a nice guy. Um, and then when he started, you could see something in him. You could see that he was interested in certain parts of the job. You could see that he had a flair for data and a flair for sort of detail. But he would turn up for work, wouldn't shave, shirt would be untucked at the back, never wear a tie, his hair would be a mess, and he would have a lot of time off. And I can remember sitting down with him and having a real honest conversation around, look, you've got skill, you've got talent, and actually... I can see in you um, somebody that could progress quite quickly through this company. However, you've also got flaws and this is what they are. So I'm going to give you a choice now. You can either go home and not come back or you can um, go home, have a haircut, come back tomorrow with a nice shirt and a tie and we can forget this conversation ever happened. Kind of left it up to him. And he was there at 10 past, 10 past 8 the next morning with a tie on, his hair done. We never mentioned that conversation again. Sometimes I'll bring it up with him if I want to sort of, you know, stick the knife in a little bit. <laughs> but he has been absolutely amazing ever since. And I've, he's someone in my more recent career that I've seen develop and grow and have a family and buy a house. And I think um, that's, it, it is sometimes being quite open and honest and frank with people and saying look you've got the skill you've got all the attributes you need to be successful but actually you need to now apply it and you need to show that you want it and I think with that particular guy he still works for me now he's worked for me for 10 years I can't get rid of him so <laughs> you know but and I wouldn't want to to be fair so um so yeah no I think that's I think sometimes it sounds like he was in a bit of a rut and and perhaps would it be fair to say uh, a bit of self like lack of self-confidence oh yeah I think I think I mean he, you know there is that element of what happens away from the workplace and I think there's lots of stuff going on outside but you know um I can remember going round to fix his toilet for him because you know he had no one else to help him so sometimes it is as an employer seeing the big picture and it's whether or not you're willing to accommodate some of those issues outside of work I always have been for the right people um so, so yeah, I think you have to consider the full picture. And I think more so nowadays with a lot more awareness around mental health, you have to show consideration for stuff that might be happening away from the workplace. And there's a good employer. Why wouldn't you want to do that? You know, why wouldn't you want to sort of look after your people? Um, and I've always kind of thought that, you know, and I mentioned it a little bit with the staff room in retail, you know, if you look after people and you show an interest and you take care of them, then they will be loyal to you, you know. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that kind of makes sense <laughs> yeah no abs absolutely i think that that quite often 
I've worked in in places. Well, I've worked in um, some companies where people are taken for granted, mm. and and they're just a number. Mm. And it's th- th- some of the language that's been used for like giving out orders and stuff. It's mm. like you, you kind of bite your tongue, but you think I'm not just hanging around here. Mm. So so it's yeah, absolutely absolutely makes sense. And I think that that people take real value from that. So mm. so thanks for sharing that, Jay. Yeah, sure. In in regards to that chap who had a terrible CV, and uh, I'll, I'll let you into that, listener. That is me. So <laughs> yeah, the worst CV I'd ever seen, I think. Yep. Yeah, I had a terrible CV. Yep. Um, so um, hopefully I'll turn that around now. But I haven't seen your CV recently, but <laughs> I wouldn't want to comment. <laughs> yeah. Um, you'll have to update that. Yeah. Um, but but for those people who are who are perhaps thinking about either making a switch or they need to use a CV for a promotion or something like that that's coming up. Um, what is it from your point of view as like a hiring manager that that would help people consider what to put on a CV? Um, I think um, think about how much of your previous career is relevant. Um, so perhaps don't go back more than three three roles unless there's anything really relevant that's happened before that. I think when you're talking about experience and the things that you've done, I always like people to be able to quantify that. So, you know, I helped increase sales. Okay. How, <laughs> how much? <laughs> By how much and what did you do to do that? You know, I, I'm the sort of person who would look at a CV and expect to have some sort of depth around, I did this by doing that. Um, and then I think don't go over two pages and also be really careful about what you put in terms of hobbies and interests. You know, try and think about something interesting as opposed to I like walking and socialising. Um, but I think for me it is that element of um, capture the relevant experience, quantify any achievements that you've got, and then same with qualifications. Some people put lists and lists of stuff on there, but think about the role that you're applying for and try and pick out the qualifications that you've got. Also as well, look, be a little bit smart about what grades you put on there. Um, I always put um, achieve six GCSEs. <laughs> I don't say what grade they were, mm-hmm. but and I think you know employers, particularly after a certain period of time, wouldn't necessarily want to know the the exact results. So I would say um, pretty much that you know keep the experience relevant, keep the qualifications relevant, quantify any achievements that you've made, and don't have a CV that's more than two pages long. The other thing I would say to that person with the dodgy CV, if they're listening, is put stuff in the relevant order. So put the stuff that you've done more recently at the start and put the fact that you did washing up in a pub in 1992 at the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, learn from my mistake there, listener. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's not advisable <laughs> to yeah. be putting your kitchen duties um, on CVs. No. Um, I think that's a sound advice mm. um, and, and hopefully that will give you a bit of an idea of how to approach that. Um, for those people who are listening, um, there is a link in the show notes that will um, provide you um, access to some tips, tricks and advice on CV writing. Mm-hmm. Um, so follow that and you can sign up and get a free download um, that we're going to be making available to you. So one of the things you mentioned just then was how when you are writing a CV, you don't necessarily put the exact grades on there that you, you achieved it. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, you know, coming just fresh out of school, that might be the case where you, they they might ask you for those particular achievements. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. You don't necessarily, nobody's going to go check in what grades that, that you got um, back then. Um, but thinking about those people who have just finished school um, and and they didn't, they were a little bit dis- disappointed with what they achieved maybe. Mm. Have you got any kind of advice or, or anything that you could give to those people? Um, I think I would say um, to try and keep things in perspective. I think when you do your GCSEs, you're 16 years old. That is incredibly young, incredibly young. It's, it is too young to say at that point, I've wrecked my entire life. Um, I think you have options available. I was really lucky when I was that age. I've got great parents who I did listen to eventually who <laughs> who were uh, who did sit me down and have uh an open and frank conversation with me around what my options were and what they thought I should do so that helped and I would say find somebody to talk to if you can't speak to your parents speak to an aunt speak to a cousin speak to a a friend about what options there are obviously at cube we have some great 
uh, advisors and as you mentioned there are some links that people can follow and I'm sure you'll give those out but find somebody to speak to about what your options are at 16 years old there is no way that you could possibly do something particularly around an exam that is going to mess your life up for good um, when you look at people like Richard Branson and Alan Sugar they didn't go down an academic route yet they went on to achieve great things I remember hearing a story uh, a couple of days ago about one of our trainees who left school with no qualifications who's now running his own business so failing your GCSEs is not a blocker to be able to go on and do something else it's not to say that you shouldn't try and do well because that is really important but I think looking at the options and now more than ever there are more options available to young people than, than there was certainly when I was um, 16 but yeah, so I think that would be my, my advice is, is put things in, into perspective um, and find someone or somewhere where you can go and talk about what your options are. Um, don't let it get you down. Don't start to beat yourself up. And I think just um, keep things in perspective. Um, that would be my advice anyway. <laughs> and and I ask that is a bit of a loaded question because you mentioned how you don't necessarily put the grades that you got on your CV. So would I be right in saying that that's because they weren't necessarily the the best grades. They possible. were terrible. I got a B in English language, and that was the best grade that I got. Everything else was E's and F's, and I think I might have had a U chucked in there as well. Um, anybody that knows me will know that I probably would have done well in English language because I tend to talk a lot. Um, but I, I did very poorly in my exams. I was a bit, I'm going to say unfortunate, in that I've got a twin sister um, so when we were going through school, she was very studious. She enjoyed uh, school work. She always did her homework. I was the opposite. Like I said, I, I wasn't bad at school, but I wasn't interested in the right things. I liked sport. Um, I liked anything that happened in between lessons. And I did enjoy lessons, but I always kind of thought I could do it better. I mean, I remember in business studies, I got in trouble because we had to do a, a task. We had to set up a business. And um, we had to, part of the task was how much money could you make? And I got in trouble because there was a group of three of us and I left the group to go and take orders. We decided to do a car washing task. So we went and bought some buckets and sponges and um, I left my two people in the car park with their buckets and sponges and I went around the whole school and spoke to every single teacher and asked them if we wanted them to wash our car, uh, to wash their car at lunchtime. I had 20 teachers say yes at uh, £10 each, I think it was. That was £5 each, I'm not going to exaggerate. Um, <laughs> and I got told off because we weren't allowed to wander around the school uh, during, so we basically got disqualified. But I think the best performing team made about 30 quid, and if they'd have let us go ahead, we would have made 100. So um, I'd think, hang on a minute, you're telling me you want me to do a business task, but you're not letting me go out and do sales and marketing. So so I used to get a bit frustrated sometimes with the, the rules and boundaries of school. Um, I can remember my mum pleading with me to at least try and do some revision. But like I mentioned earlier, Sensible Soccer had came out on the Amiga around that time. So I was starting to get quite good at that. Um, my obsession to do well meant that I had to continually improve my league position. And when results day came, I can remember my sister went to the school to pick up her envelope and she did really well. She got all A's and B's. And I can remember thinking, OK, this is going to be a little bit tricky. Um, I waited for my results to come through the post. And I can remember when the postman arrived here in the van pull up in the driveway hearing the letters come through the letterbox and I was in the bath at the time and I can remember hearing my mum come up the stairs and under the door this envelope appeared and I laid in the bath until the water went stone cold and my fingers were like uh, prunes and then eventually I got out dried myself off opened the envelope and I knew what was going to be in there. I knew what was going to be in there. It wasn't any worse than I was expecting. But seeing it in black and white suddenly made it real. And I remember at that point feeling like this electric shock of anger like down my spine. Because I knew the reason that I'd failed it wasn't because I was stupid or whatever. It was because I hadn't applied myself and I hadn't made effort. But what I can also remember at that point is thinking to myself, I'm never going to feel like this again. I'm never, ever going to not achieve something because I haven't tried. And I think that has kind of shaped me because it has made it's 
I always say to people, I'm driven by a fear of failure because I don't want to ever feel like that again. And that can be quite hard sometimes to deal with when things aren't going quite as you want. You start to beat yourself up a little bit. But that did teach me a lesson. I probably learned more in that 30 seconds than I'd done in the previous five years of school. Um, and then obviously I had to take the, the piece of paper out to show my mum um, who gave me the inevitable I told you so lecture. I had to wait for my dad to come back from work. He then gave me the inevitable um, lecture. He also told me that I should learn a trade, which if I could go back 20 years, I would have done, but I didn't. Um, and then once all that had calmed down, we did sit down and have a conversation around, look, you have to get a job. You can't, um, you know, you can't uh, sit around here. We're not going to fund you. They were quite hard. My parents, they were kind of like, well, OK, if you're not going to go into college, you, you're going to go and get a job. Um, and looking back, that was probably, for me, the best thing. I probably needed that. Um, but like I said, by that point, I had decided that whatever I was going to do, I was going to be the best at it. And so I was the best checkout operator. I was the best store trainer. Um, and, and it kind of carried on from there, really. So, so yeah, I am lucky that I have got parents who were able to sit me down and have uh, a very sensible conversation with me about what I should do and how I should deal with things. I did go back and do some reset. So I did reset my English and maths. Um, uh, I thought that was important to have those those qualifications. Um, yeah, so 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 I'm not I'm not going to say that experience shapes me, but I do often wonder how I would have how I would have ended up had I have got average grades. Mm. You know, um, I wouldn't have as many interesting stories to tell. That's <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, yeah. So thanks for sharing that, Joe. I think just hearing kind of stories like that can be reassuring for people. And, and I think that um, one of the key messages is that, you know, it's up to you now. And it is. And I, I, there's something else I feel I should get out as well. I've got two kids. I've got a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. And it's really interesting now as a parent because obviously I want them to do well. But I've got the older one, the seven-year-old, enjoys school he enjoys maths he enjoys english he has a thirst for knowledge which i think is brilliant and i obviously try and embrace that and encourage him the younger one enjoys school but actually he's much more practical you know he built this fantastic lego house at the weekend and when i asked him to show me about show me what it was he was able to explain that this is the bedroom for that and this is the stairway that leads to the secret hideaway and all that stuff. This amazing imagination. And I think you almost embrace what they do and what they learn and how they go about it in completely different ways. And I, I can remember I've got, uh, I've got a friend who lives near me who, similar to me, left school with no qualifications, but he said he knew what he wanted to do from the age of about 12. He wanted to be a builder. So he learnt the stuff he knew that he'd need to be a builder and nothing else and now he's got like three houses and god knows what how many cars and i think i'm not i'm not promoting not passing exams as the way forward i think for me the most important thing is what i said a few moments ago that actually it's not the end if you you're at such a young age that it's not it's not the end and you know if you read books like alan sugar's life story for example you know he built up a business lost everything started again when he was in his 30s you know it's not it's never too late to start learning it's never too late to improve on something that you've done wrong or a mistake you've made so i think that would be certainly what i would try and in, embed into my children is that have a go do your best and if you screw it up go back and try something else try a different approach you know so that relentless crossliness will always shine through <laughs> anyway sorry <laughs> uh, absolutely amazing um just leads me to say thank you for your time joe um absolute pleasure speaking to you today and um for anyone who's perhaps in that place where they're a bit lost or or a little bit disappointed with what their position is at the moment what kind of advice or key takeaway would you give them to help them realize their potential Somebody said to me about five years ago, um, when I even I was at a bit of a crossroads at that time and I was kind of thinking, what do I want to do? Do I want to go down this way? Do I want to do that? And I sat and spoke to someone for about an hour and they said to me at the end, I've listened to you and actually 
you've got the ability to go and do whatever you want. So the best piece of advice I would give you is the best thing you can do is the best that you can possibly do. And I think for anybody, that is pretty sound advice and it will take you as far as you want it to take you. Awesome, Joe. That was amazing. And thank you so much once again for your time. And I hope that the listener has taken much value from this. And uh, I hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Right Route Podcast. Like we said at the start, if this is the first time you're listening, then why not go back and check out any of the Series 1 episodes featuring Cody Damale, star of the BBC's The Apprentice, where we discuss all aspects of career development and hear from different special guests who are at different stages of their career. Equally, it would be really helpful for us if you could leave us a rating and review in the podcast app of your choice. And if you do have any questions or suggestions of topics, then we'd love to hear from you by emailing podcast at cube-learning.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to be updated when we release new episodes. We hope this has helped answer some questions you might have about your career choices. And until next time, take care.